Well, good morning and welcome to Haven Heights Baptist Church. Welcome to those who are here and welcome to those listening online. A few announcements here before we begin. At our members meeting last week, uh, we voted to get rid of the extra pews that are in the hallways and in the foyer. We need to get rid of those uh, per the fire marshal's request. And so if you would like one of those pews, please see Paul Salini or you can email me, but uh, those pews, you can look at them in the hallways and in the foyer need to go. And so if you'd like one, please let us know. Last week, we also voted to build a garage for our church van. So we're in need of about $5,000 of additional funds for that. And so if you would like to donate towards the garage, you can simply mark garage on the memo line of your check. Let us take a moment now to prepare our hearts for worship. Our call to worship comes from Psalm 95, verses 6 and 7. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture, the flock under His care. The word of our God. Would you please stand with me? I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful in my Savior's love for me. For me it was in the garden, he prayed not my will but thine. He had no tears for his own griefs, but sweat drops of blood for mine. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. He took my sins and my sorrows, he made them his very own. He bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. When with the ransomed in glory, his face I at last shall see, twill be my joy through the ages to sing of his love for me. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. <clears throat> my Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine, for thee all the follies of sin I 
I resign, my gracious Redeemer, my Savior art Thou. If ever I love Thee, my Jesus, tis now. I love Thee because Thou hast first loved me and purchased my pardon on Calvary's tree. I love thee for where brow. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. I'll love thee in life. I'll love thee in death. And praise thee lendest me breath and say when the death do lies hold on my brow if ever I love thee my Jesus tis now in mansions of and endless delight. I'll ever adore thee in heaven so bright, and singing thy praises before thee I'll bow. If Jesus tis now. You may be seated. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Let's pray together. Father God, this morning we pray in a posture of submission. We kneel our heart before you. We recognize that you are God, and we are not. We recognize that you are our maker. We recognize that we are under your care. We recognize that we are not our own, but that we belong to you. We are the creature. You are the creator. And yet you care for us. And so we pray for our concerns this hour. And we pray that you would provide for our every need. We think of those in sickness, and we pray for healing. We think of those in pain and we pray for relief. We think of those in need and we pray for resources. We think of those who are lonely and we pray for friendship. We think of those in difficult relationships and we pray for peace. We think of those who are anxious and we pray for the peace that surpasses all understanding. We pray for those who are mourning and we pray for comfort. We pray for those with depression and we pray for hope. And Father, these are just some of the needs this hour. Father, we pray to you because you are the God who cares for us. Father, this hour, we pray that we would hear from you. Father, we, this hour, we pray that your word would come alive to us. We pray that your Holy Spirit would illuminate your word. We pray that your word would wash over us and change us from the inside out. Father, we pray that you would do this great mercy for us this hour. We pray for our brothers and sisters in Ukraine 
And Father, we pray that you would give our Christian brothers and sisters a massive confidence in you despite their fears. And Father, we pray for this nation. And Father, we pray that war may be averted. We pray for Trinity Church. And we pray that your gospel would ring out from their gathering. We pray that many would come to know you through this church. We pray for our small groups meeting this evening. And we pray that we, your people, would be encouraged. And we pray that we, your people, would be spurred on towards faith through these gatherings. We pray for the tithes and offerings this morning. And we pray that you would use these monies to further your gospel. We pray that the good news of your son Jesus would go deeper in our hearts. And we pray that it would go further around the world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good morning. Let's continue our worship together.
If you have your Bible, I invite you to turn to the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 11. On that day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us how to pray, just as John taught his disciples. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, give us each day our daily bread, forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. Then Jesus said to them, Suppose you have a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, Don't bother me. The door is already locked, and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, Even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of his friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who seek him? The word of our God.
you have your Bible, I invite you to turn to the book of Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. One of the great mysteries of the Christian life is prayer. Prayer is one of the great mysteries of the Christian life. And our scripture reading this morning highlights this mystery. The disciples come to the Lord and they ask him, would you teach us how to pray? The apostles, they see the life of Jesus, they hear his teaching, they witness his miracles, and they realize your life is not like my life. And they realize his intimacy with God the Father. And so they ask him, will you teach us how to pray? And their request here is absolutely telling. They, they don't ask him for an explanation of prayer. They don't say, Jesus, would you explain to us how God's sovereignty is compatible with human freedom? They don't say, hey, would you give us a seminar on prayer? Would you just show us, you know, you know what this prayer thing's all about? No. They say, teach us how to do that. Give us access to the power of God that you have. That's their request. And many of us have that same request this hour. And we want to know, how can I pray that I experience the power of God in my life and in my situation? The disciples ask Jesus, teach us how to pray. We would be wise to do the same thing right now. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you right now. And Father, we pray that your spirit, that the spirit of Christ would instruct us how to pray. Father, just as your disciples marveled at the prayer life of Jesus. Father, we pray that we would get that same instruction through your Spirit. And so, Father, we pray for these next moments. Father, we pray that we would hear from you. And we pray that we would be encouraged. In Christ's name we ask. Amen. Ephesians chapter 3, beginning in verse 14. For this reason I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of God in Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the full measure of the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine, according to all of his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. The big idea this morning is how to pray. Many of us are asking that question, how should I pray? Three ways from the text we see how to pray. Number one, pray with humility. That's first, pray with humility. Second, pray for the Holy Spirit. Pray for the Holy Spirit. And then third, pray with hope. So pray for humility, pray for the Holy Spirit, pray with hope. So first, from the text, we see that we are to pray with humility. Verse 14, for this reason I kneel before the Father. Paul is kneeling in prayer. Now there's many positions in which we can pray, but kneeling is one posture frequently mentioned in the Scripture. And in the Bible, kneeling is always a sign of humility. So the Apostle Paul kneels in humble recognition that all that I have is from God. All that I have, it's not from me, but it's from you. Humility is the reason that Paul prays. 
Paul prays because he knows that everything the Christian has is from God. As we've been going through this short little book, the book of Ephesians, we have seen this over and over again. We see all that we have is from God. We were dead, but he made us alive. We were deserving of his wrath, but he saved us. We were separate from Christ, but he united us to him. We were far away, but he has brought us near. We were strangers and aliens, but he has made us his family. And we have seen over and over again that it is God who does these things, not us, but him. And so Paul prays because God is the God who gives all that we need, and he is the only place to get them. Both are true. God gives all that we need, and he's the only place to get what we need. We need to be right with God. Jesus is the one who does that. Jesus is the one who saves, chapter 1. We need to be set free from a sin. Jesus is the one who does that. He enables us to walk in the good works that he's already prepared, chapter 2. We want peace with others. We have conflict all around us. Jesus is the one who provides that peace, chapter 2. Jesus is the one who provides all that we need. And prayer begins with humbly admitting, I need your help. I've got nowhere else to go. I need your help. I kneel before the Father. Now, at this point, we already need to begin to talk about unanswered prayers. We all have these things that we pray for, and they don't seem to come to pass. And when the things that we pray for don't seem to come to pass, we all experience the same temptation. And when our prayers don't seem to come to pass, our great temptation is to no longer bow the knee, but to raise the fist. When the prayer is not answered in our way, and in our time, the temptation is to seek illegitimate things. When the prayer is not answered in our time and in our way, our great temptation is to self-medicate, or to gossip, or to slander, or to get even. When the prayer is not answered in our time and in our way, the great temptation is almost retaliation. God, if you don't do this for me, well, then I'm not serving you. When God doesn't answer our prayer in our time and in our way, the great temptation is to give up holiness and righteousness. But if you're not going to answer my prayer, I'm done trying to be godly. When the prayer is unanswered, the requirement is still the same. I kneel before the Father. I think we can be greatly helped here by thinking about every story and every movie. Every story and every movie has the same arc or the same trajectory. So first we meet the character, and then after we meet the character, there's always some sort of conflict. So something isn't working out. There's pain or there's misery or there's disappointment, maybe even a war. Every story has a different problem, but a problem nonetheless. So every story has the same elements, right? It starts with the characters, and then there's the conflict, and then every story has a resolution. Every movie, every story, same basic arc, character, conflict, resolution. And here's the thing. We read the book, or we go to the movie, and we know what's going to happen we know there's going to be a resolution, and we go because we can't get enough of it. We can't get enough of seeing how things work out. And so here's the thing this morning. If God is not answering your prayer, it's because he's choosing to allow the conflict in order so that he can bring about the resolution that our heart is longing for. If he's not answering your prayer, he's allowing conflict so that he can bring about the resolution that our heart is longing for. And we know the resolution is coming because the Bible tells us so. 
book of Revelation, everyone is standing around the throne and praising God. And yes, they're praising God for who he is. So they're praising God for his beauty. They're praising him for his majesty. They're praising him for his holiness. They're praising him for his glory. But they are also praising him for something else. Praising him for what he has done. Church, one day we will gather around the throne and we will praise God for the resolution that he has provided. Listen to Revelation chapter 4, verse 12. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. These are our future words that will be proclaimed. Wisdom. You have wisdom. You rescued us in the perfect way. Thanks. You did what we could not. Honor. You got it exactly right. Power and strength. You alone could have done this, not me, but you. We will praise God for all of eternity, not only because of who he is, but because of what he has done. And what has he done? He has rescued us from our sins, and not only our sins, but he has rescued us from every single trouble. And So this morning, if you're praying, and God is not answering your prayer, he will. And we know that he will because the Bible tells us in heaven we will gather around the throne and praise him for his answered prayer. And so this morning, whether God is answering our prayer or whether God seems to not be answering our prayer, our call is the same. We are to pray in humility. Jesus, you are my only hope. And I submit to you. Second, we're to pray for the Holy Spirit. In verses 16 through 19, we see the Apostle Paul praying, and he's praying for one thing. He prays, Father, would the Holy Spirit dwell within them? What we need more than anything this morning is for the Holy Spirit to dwell in here. So that's the prayer. Father, would the Holy Spirit dwell in the hearts of your people? Paul prays, would you grant them the dwelling of your Holy Spirit? Verse 16, out of your glorious riches. It's like this. If we were to win the lottery, we all know the first thing that we would do with the money. All of us know that. If I win the Powerball, 536 million or whatever it is, I know the first dollar that I'm going to spend because I already have it planned out what it's going to go to. This is sort of like what the Apostle Paul is saying. Out of all of the riches that you have, which are endless, the first place that I'd like you to spend it is that your children may know that the Holy Spirit is living inside of them. Now, if we know our Bibles, perhaps we know that this sounds a little bit strange. Because every child of God already has the Spirit living inside of them. In fact, that's the mark of the child of God. The child of God is marked by the Holy Spirit living inside of them. And yet Paul prays, would, would the Holy Spirit live inside of them? So the prayer can't simply be for the Spirit to live inside of them, because that's already happened. His prayer is more like this. Would they be continually aware of that reality. May they be continually aware that the Spirit is dwelling within them. Everyone's seen the cartoon where the devil is on one shoulder and the angel's on the other shoulder. And the angel and the devil are sort of duking it out. And they're both trying to get the person to carry out their plan. And one is on each side speaking solutions and suggestions. And something similar is happening to the child of God. And the only difference is that that battle is not outside of us, but it's actually inside of us. It's verse 16 in the inner self. 
Within the child of God, there's two competing forces. Two competing forces. There's the flesh and the spirit. And the flesh and the spirit, they wage war against one another. And the spirit desires that we please God. And the flesh desires that we please ourselves. And the spirit and the flesh are battling against one another in an effort to be heard and in an effort to be pleased. And so this morning, if you feel that battle, if you feel that battle, it's a good thing. Because if you feel that battle of the flesh waging war against the spirit, it means that the spirit is actually in here to engage in battle. And so if you feel the battle, don't doubt your salvation. So many times I meet with people and they say, I I don't really know if I'm saved because the temptation feels so strong. And yet the fact that we experience the battle and the fact that the temptation does seem strong is a sign that the Spirit is in here. The real problem is that if we don't know temptation, The real problem is if we seldom feel tempted. The real problem is if we say, battle. What battle? I don't feel a battle. I just simply do as I please. If there is no battle, it means that the Spirit is not waging war because the Spirit is not there to fight. And so the Apostle Paul's prayer is this. Father, would you cause them to know that the Spirit is in them? And would you cause them to know the strength of their spirit so that the Spirit might be more powerful than the flesh? Let them know the power of the Spirit that is in them so that the Spirit triumphs over the flesh. Then look out in the room this morning know so many of your stories. And I wonder how many of us are growing tired of the battle. And just being honest, some here this morning might be wondering, is the fight worth it? It's so hard to forgive. Maybe I should just let bitterness take over. Reconciliation is so hard. Maybe I just need to move on. It is so hard to return kindness for evil. You know, maybe a little truth would wake them up. It's exhausting to wait on the Lord. Maybe there's other ways to cope. Verse 16, may they be strengthened by the Spirit that is in them. May the Spirit rule and reign so powerfully and wonderfully that holiness is the only real option. That's his prayer. Let them know the power of the Spirit, that the Spirit always overcomes the flesh, that holiness is the only option. And yet, just being honest, sometimes we do give way to temptation. And every time we give way to temptation, every time the flesh wins out over the spirit, it's always for the same reason. We give way to temptation because we doubt that God really loves us. Think back to Genesis chapter 3. A serpent somehow makes its way into the garden, and a serpent slithers up to Eve. And the serpent asked this question to Eve. Does God really love you? Does he have your best interest at heart? Don't you think things might be better if you took matters into your own hands? I can't help but notice this fruit over here. And if you eat this fruit, you'll have everything that you ever wanted. And that's the only place to get it because God is holding out on you. God doesn't want you to have it. God doesn't really love you. Every sin has that same component. In every sin, we don't really believe that God is for us. 
And in every sin, we don't really believe that God loves us. And so we steal because we don't believe that God loves us enough to provide. And we have the sharp tongue because we don't believe that God loves us enough to defend us. Or we lie because we don't believe that God loves us enough to help us in the truth. Or we lust or we covet or we envy because we don't really believe that God loves us enough to give us what we need. Every sin is a statement, I don't really think God loves me. And so Paul addresses that. And Paul prays, verse 18, let them be rooted and established in your love. May they be grounded in your love. May they be settled in your love. Would they never doubt your love again? And so would you show them the width and the height and the length and the depth of your love for them? Show them your all-encompassing, all-extensive love for them. Let them Know that. God has shown us his love in Christ. God chose us before the foundation of the world. When we were nothing, we were on the mind of God. God chose us before we could ever choose him. God sent his son to die in our place. God asked Jesus, would you die for these people. And Jesus not only said yes, he said yes in joy. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. God adopted us as his sons and daughters. He made us a part of his family. God is now our father and Jesus is our brother. And not only are we second class people, no, we are first class people in the family of God. He has made us co-heirs with Christ. He gives us the same rights and privileges as his own son, Jesus. As one author so helpfully put it, when we read the scriptures, it almost seems as though God loves us more than he loves his own son, Jesus. The love of God can be summarized like this. He is always for us. God is for us when we live for him. In our attempts at holiness and righteousness, he is making us his masterpiece. And in our sin, he still considers us holy and blameless. And before we even existed, we were chosen and predestined. God is for us in our holiness. He is for us in our sin. And he is for us before we even were. The love of God is this. He is always for us. There's not a time, there's not a moment when our God is not for us. Verse 19, that love surpasses knowledge. And it surpasses knowledge because that love is unlike any other love. So much of what we call love is what I'm going to call pizza love. So sometimes my family will get a pizza and I'll go out to pick up the pizza, and when I bring the pizza home, oftentimes one of my children will say, Daddy, I love you. And they do love me, but there's a sense in which they say, Daddy, I love you because they like what I did for them. And they like the way the pizza tastes, and they like to have full bellies, and they say, I love you because of what you did. The love of God surpasses knowledge because the love God has for us is separate, independent, apart from anything we do for him. That's what surpasses knowledge. There's no other love like that. God doesn't love us for what he can get from us. God loves us simply because he chooses to love us, period. Period. There's no more. God loves us because he loves us, and that surpasses any human knowledge or understanding of love. He loves us because he loves us. And so Paul prays, verse 19, may they be filled with that knowledge. May we be filled with the love of God for us. Because knowing 
at least a sliver or a part of God's love for us, is what changes us. The knowledge that God loves us is actually what spurs us to be godly. You see, when we are filled with the love of God, it pushes everything else to the perimeter. When we are filled with God's love, it's impossible to be hateful or resentful. When we're filled with the love of God, we can't be angry. When we're filled with the love of God, we can't be bitter. When we are filled with the love that God has for us, we can't be sinful. When we are filled, verse 19, with the knowledge of God's love, we are actually filled with the fullness of God himself. And when we are filled with God, we live for God. And so what should we pray for this morning? We should pray, Spirit, live in here and live in here in such a way that you continually show me the love that God has for me. Spirit, continually show me the love that God has for me. Third, pray with hope. We should pray with hope. And pray with hope because we have hope, and we have hope because our God has all the power. Listen as the Apostle Paul talks about the power of God. Just listen as he piles up these phrases, one on top of another. Verse 20, God is able. Our God can do it. He is able to do. He's able to act in our situation. He's able to do so abundantly. He has more power than we even recognize. He is able to do abundantly more than we can ask. His power is not limited to our mere request. He is able to do so abundantly more than we can ask or that we can think. His power is never limited, not even by our imagination. Our God is the God who has more than enough power to answer our prayers and more. Verse 20, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. When we pray, our hope is that God, through his spirit, will act for us, in us, and even through us. That's what we're hoping for when we pray. God, we pray that you would act for us. We pray that you'd act in us, do something in here, and we even pray that you'd act through us, that through us things would start to happen. So think of Elijah. This is from James chapter 5. Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed. And the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. Elijah was an ordinary man, and through this ordinary man, God did an extraordinary thing. That's the promise that God is making to us. You guys are ordinary people, and through ordinary people, I'm going to do an extraordinary thing when we pray. Now, I'd imagine that there's some here today who say, well, I'm praying. I'm praying for God to act. And nothing's happening. And I know nothing of the power that you speak of. I've never had an Elijah moment. I pray for things and I just seem to get nothing. Just as we think of Elijah, we should also think of the Apostle Paul. Because sometimes the power of God is made perfect in our weakness. The Apostle Paul, he has the thorn in the flesh. And we don't really know what it is, but we know that Paul wants it gone. And so Paul prays, Father, would you take this thorn away from me? Would you take it away so I can be more useful to you? And God says no. And God does nothing about the thorn. Paul is a guy who preached regularly. He is called to be an apostle. He preaches, and more often than not, nothing seems to happen. 
This one time in Acts chapter 16, he goes to the Areopagus. It's a perfect opportunity to preach the gospel to the world scholars. And he prays, Father, let them believe. He preaches and they mock him. The Apostle Paul, he longs to take the gospel everywhere. And so he tries to go to Asia Minor, and the Spirit says, no, you're not going there. He says, okay, well, I'm going to go to Bithynia, and the Spirit says, no, you're not going there. And Paul prayed, Father, let these people believe, and the Spirit says, no, you're not going there. How many of us feel like that this morning? How many of us feel so weak, and we pray for things And God is either silent or he says no. And they're good things, godly things, great things. And the Spirit says no and nothing seems to happen. And yet we have that pesky little verse. God is able to do more than we can ask or imagine. And yet it feels as though he's doing nothing. And we have that thorn that prevents us. Maybe it's a physical thorn. And our health prevents us from doing what we'd like to do. Or maybe it's a spiritual thorn. Maybe it's anxiety or depression or embedding sin. Maybe it's a financial thing. There isn't enough money. And we have the thorn. And if only the thorn was removed, then I could do all that God wants me to do. Maybe we pray and things never seem to work out. And it always seems as though there's something great on the horizon. So there's the job interview, or there's the vacation, or there's the date, or there's time with family, and we want God to do great things, and it seems so possible, and yet there's always disappointment. Just like Paul in the Areopagus. The opportunity of opportunities to preach the scholars, and they're hanging on his every word, and they reject him, mock him. Disappointment. How many of us beg God, use me, let me help her, let me share the gospel with him. And that person is close to us. And it's like the Spirit says, no. This is the life of the Apostle Paul. And yet the Lord used the Apostle Paul more than he could ever ask or imagine. The Lord used the Apostle Paul, verse 21, to bring glory in the church. Millions, untold millions of people can trace our spiritual lineage back to Paul. God used all of that weakness somehow to bring millions to Christ. And in all of that weakness, The Apostle Paul, verse 21, brought glory to Jesus. And Jesus surely said of his apostle, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done, despite all of the setbacks and hindrances. And so it is this morning. If you are desiring to know the fullness of God, if you are desiring for the Spirit to reign in our heart, regardless of our circumstances, and regardless of the unanswered prayer, verse 20 is absolutely true. And our God will use us for far more than we can ask or imagine. Let's pray. Father God, this morning we ask that you would answer our prayers. Father, so many of us even now are praying for the big things. And Father, we ask that you would grant them. We ask for our relationships to have peace. We ask for our family members to know you. We ask for our needs to be met. Father, you know every heart. And you know every request, and you know every request that was not even asked. And Father, we pray that you would grant them all. And Father, we pray that you would grant them all even more than we can ask or imagine. And Father, should you choose to work in our weakness, we pray that you'd give us confidence that you are still doing more than we can ask or imagine. 
And Father, if the answer to our prayer is wait, or even no, Father, we pray that we would be rooted and established in your love. Father, we pray that you'd put a hedge of protection around us. In this sense, Father, we pray that we would never doubt your love for us. Father, we pray for you to work. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. He is able to do far more than we can ask or imagine. And he's able to do it because he's working through us. Let's meditate on that truth as we sing. Thank you.
complete. 